colleagues and friends, good evening. I'm Al Bloom, Vice Chancellor of NYU Abu Dhabi, and it's a privilege to offer you a very, very warm welcome to this special NYU Abu Dhabi Institute event dedicated to the memory of our dear colleague and uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor of NYU Abu Dhabi, Hillary Ballin. We deeply appreciate, Oren, there you are. We deeply appreciate uh, that Oren, Hillary's husband, and that Sophie, Hillary's daughter, are joining us tonight. We thank John Sexton, founding president of NYU Abu Dhabi, and Marriott Westermann, founding provost, for returning to campus to relive with us the memories of the remarkable birth of this institution and of Hillary's fundamental role in forging its vision and its quality. And we thank each of you whose presence here tonight so enhances the warmth and the meaning of this occasion. Hillary envisioned an institution whose special character would emerge from its capacity to integrate a liberal arts college and a research university, each of uncompromising quality. An institution that builds on its unique multiple identity as a pioneering campus of NYU, a leading university of Abu Dhabi, and a world center of innovative pedagogy and disciplinary and interdisciplinary creativity and an institution that places both education and research boldly in the service of a more informed, productive, humane, and peaceful globe. She worked tirelessly with consummate devotion and skill to ensure that NYUAD would meet these aspirations. She helped design and incubate many of the distinctive components of our academic program, including the J-term, the core, several disciplinary and inter interdisciplinary majors and concentrations, the affiliated faculty program, and more recently, our art gallery and our art center. A formidable architectural imagination contributed centrally to the attractiveness and intimacy of our initial downtown campus and to the grandeur and extraordinary fit to our own educational mission of our permanent Saudi at home. As Deputy Vice Chancellor, she connected the campus to NYU New York and to the global network as a whole, generously taking on at any moment any task that an emerging university would require and completing that task with grace, precision, and wisdom. And all the while, she steadily advanced her own professional stature as an architectural historian to ever wider disciplinary and global acclaim. She was a brilliant thinker, a transformative teacher, a powerful champion of NYU Abu Dhabi, a formative contributor to the breadth of its distinctive excellence, and the source of countless intellectual and human connections across our entire community. She was a treasured partner to me personally and to every one of us at NYUAD. We miss her deeply. At the unanimous urging of our faculty, NYUAD created, in her honor, the Hillary Ballin Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning. We will be dedicating a plaque in, in, at Washington Square North in New York in her honor. And in recognition of Hillary's magnificent contribution to the beauty and functionality of this campus, we look forward to naming a significant space here in her honor. When she heard that the NYUAD faculty had created the Hillary Ballin Center for Excellence and Teaching, Hillary wrote to me, Dear Al, I was overwhelmed by your message. I am so deeply honored by the tribute the faculty have conferred upon me, and I hope you will relay my profound gratitude to everyone. The joys of working together to hone our teaching in the core, the beautiful sense of shared purpose and of learning from each other, these were highlights of shaping the core and building an ethos of teaching excellence at NYUAD. It was a life-altering privilege to have been part of bringing NYUAD into being. My heart is heavy with appreciation, joy, and love for you all. I am profoundly honored by the honor you've bestowed upon me, Hillary. Hillary's brilliance, vision, and care will live on in the model this institution sets for education in the 21st century. Thank you, Hillary. It is now my great privilege to invite Phil Kennedy Professor of Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies, Faculty Director of the Institute, 
and Editor-in-Chief of the Library for Arabic Literature to introduce the next speakers in tonight's program. Phil. Thank you, Al, for those wonderful words, um, which are very moving and so true. Um, so as I address the, uh, the hall, I'm reminded of the fact that I worked with Hillary for a long time, and she was always very supportive of me. But she always had a concern about the projection of my voice. <laughs> so <clears throat> it got better, and once she told me so. But if it gets worse this evening, just throw a tomato at me or, or whatnot. <laughs> no. I'm truly honored to, to be here tonight moderating this session for someone who I admired, like I admire a few people. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, our two luminaries, the moon and the sun and the moon, by which I'm eclipsed on stage. Um, it's a terrific honor to, and I'm so pleased that you have been able to come here, Mariette Westerman, who was one of Hillary's closest friends, as I'm sure you know, who is uh, currently executive vice president of the Andrew Mellon Foundation, uh, overseeing their academic program of grants, uh, among many things. And she was, most notably for the occasion today, the, the first provost of NYU Abu Dhabi, working closely with Hillary and John until 2010, having worked on the development of the project from its inception in the summer of 2007, even the spring of 2007. She is herself, uh, by training, a distinguished art historian. Before her involvement in NYU Abu Dhabi, she was director and Paulette Goddard professor of, at the IFA, the Institute for Advanced... Um, let's see, the Fine Arts. Institute Fine Arts. Same thing. So, <laughs> forgive me. Before that, she helped teaching in direct, directorial positions at the Clark Institute up in Massachusetts and Rutgers University. She has written many books on Dutch art, and notably on Jan Steen and his comic art, and another work on Rembrandt. And her first book was A Worldly Art, The Dutch Republic, 1585 to 1718. Before asking you to speak, I'm just briefly going to introduce John. Now, it's very difficult to... <laughs> to introduce John briefly, not to split the infinitive. I, I think that's enough. <laughs> but I wanted to tell my story about the oh, okay. famous lecture <laughs> by A.J. Eyre, who gave a fantastic lecture once at Oxford on, on philosophy. And a woman went up to him after the lecture and said, that was a fascinating lecture, Professor Eyre. Can I see your notes? So he gave her the notes written on an envelope, and all they said were Plato, Aristotle. So if you transpose that onto what I want to say about John, of course, it's that he was the dean of the law school of NYU, transforming that institution from 1988 until he became president of NYU in 2002, um, stepping down and becoming emeritus president of NYU in 2015. Um, he has held numerous civic posts of great distinction, notably as chairman of the board of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, from 2003 to 7. Now, apart from instigating and driving the creation of, of NYU Abu Dhabi with extraordinary vision and energy, he has also, at NYU, been the linchpin of the Sheikh Mohammed Scholars Program, where every year since 2008, he has taught his celebrated course on the religious clauses of the US Constitution, which is why we've always been privileged to see John around campus much more than I think would otherwise have allowed he has authored two important books on the Supreme Court of the US, on its, structure, on its structure management and responsibilities, but he might be better known for his baseball as a road to God, which is a profound reflection on the meaning of life, I think, if one knows nothing about baseball, which I always have to confess. Now, most recently, and this is a source of great pride, he jointly penned a forward in a book that carries the NYU Abu Dhabi imprint. Uh, the Disagreements of the Jurists, which is a Fatimid manual of Islamic law. The forward was co-authored by John Cochrane. Um, so thank you both for being here. Now I invite Mariette to, to talk about the life of, of Hillary that led into 
her role at NYU Abu Dhabi. Good evening, everyone. Marhaba. Oren and Sophie, John and El, Philip, Zaki, Fabio, beloved community of NYU Abu Dhabi. There are two reasons that I am standing here to speak and should will join uh, the seated uh, party here. The first is that Hillary believed she had standards. If you gave a speech, you should stand. The second is that, as many of you know, Hillary gave wonderful advice. She was a wonderful advice giver, not only because she was supportive and thoughtful, but she could also be brutally honest in a way that you would not forget. And uh, 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 yes, I see, I hear laughter of recognition. Uh, and almost exactly a year, uh, 10 years ago, I think, we had our announcement in New York City, a beautiful lunch with the partners from here that Emily Abu Dhabi was going to be launched. And first we had John give one of his beautiful, rousing speeches, very free form. He laid out a vision, even those of us in the project had never even heard the pieces and parts of, <laughs> and it was magnificent and went on for quite a while. And then I stood up and gave my prepared remarks and um, laid out a more cut and dried vision of what I thought, I still thought it was pretty good, of what a liberal arts education could be in the Middle East. And I sat down and there were a few more speeches. And afterwards, I asked Hillary, as I always did, we always checked in with each other. I said, how do you think that went? And she said, Mariette, that was a very fine speech. But as I have now joined your team, I'm going to make it my mission to ensure that you never speak after John Sexton again. <laughs> that is where, why I go first. <laughs> so I have written out my remarks, although freeform is better, and Hillary herself would speak freeform, but on this occasion, I thought I might not be able to get through it fully if I didn't. Hillary was a human being in full, a woman of uncommon grace, presence and purpose of extraordinary achievement and resilience. She lived her life with integrity, joy and resolve, even in the years after she had learned that her illness could not be cured. She stayed young of mind and spirit throughout and was usually focused more on our needs than her own. How we all wish we could have had many more years of her. Although I left Amway Abu Dhabi seven years ago, I keep in touch with my colleagues from the early years of building the institution, and it is great to have so many of you here. When I served as Vice Chancellor for Regional Campus Development, and then by Al's invitation as his first provost. These old friends always say very nice things to me about my contributions, but then immediately clarify that the single best thing I ever did for NYU was recruiting Hillary to NYU Abu Dhabi. I wholeheartedly agree. By this community here, Hillary will be forever remembered as the fearless initial architect of the curriculum. As an innovator in global education. Here's that curriculum, you still recognize it, I think. As a vigilant steward of both NYU's and Abu Dhabi's interests, and here, as you can see, as the relentless champion of J-Term and the core. You see here my scribbles on one of her beautiful drafts. And we will remember her, as she is remembered in New York, as the key liaison between NYU Abu Dhabi and what we came to know as NYU New York. She will be remembered for her dedication to the scholarly needs of her faculty and students and to the personal and familial interests of the hundreds of staff faculty and students who are willing to take a big bet on this experiment, and thank you still. But above all, she will be remembered for giving us a home. The Sadiat campus, working hand in glove with our partners at Temkin and Mubadala, and with Rafael Vignoli, Jay Barkman, and their brilliant team of architects. <coughs> Hillary would be the first to tell you that she had a tin ear for music as Sophie recounted very poignantly at the funeral in New York. But she had a certain musical talent nonetheless, because here, in the development of the Sadiat campus, she was the magisterial conductor 
of a philharmonic orchestra constituted of players who had rarely, if ever, met, came from dozens of countries and professions, and did not really know what tune they were supposed to be playing or what new instruments they should be inventing, let alone who their audience was likely to be. Out of this cacophony of personalities, interests and themes, she composed and then brought to a beautiful coda, a genuine New World Symphony. And we remember Hillary for all the gifts of patience and collaboration that helped produce this monument to education and intercultural understanding that is now MOU Abu Dhabi. So Hillary made an outsized contribution to what MOU Abu Dhabi has become in just 10 short years. That's fast for a university. By creating a flexible framework, she also made a lasting contribution to what NYU AD will yet become, as an instantiation and a model of what a capacious and interconnected education should provide to the new generations that will need to shape their world, shape their world, tackle its intractable problems, and also, and she never forgot this, reap its joys and see its marvels. Now, these remarkable accomplishments did not come out of nowhere. There was a rich life of Hillary before NYUAD. I know it's hard to imagine. So what I will try to do is sketch the arc of her intellectual and professional career and draw out some of the mental and attitudinal qualities that made her so clear-sighted about NYUAD and not only helped her see the possibilities here, but realize them with that rare combination of vision, pragmatism, and executive drive that sometimes bordered on stubbornness. A little stubbornness is good. I first met Hillary in the 1990s on the pages of her books on the urban development of 17th century Paris. These studies analyzed the formation of much of the Paris that we know today, the pre-19th century Paris. And in this book, The Paris of Henry IV, which I read when it came out in 1991, she traced the difficult rise of a ruler, of, of the King Henry IV to the throne of France in a country that was pulled apart by religious strife. To gain control of the mess, Henry converted to Catholicism and rebuilt Paris as a grand capital city. Anyone who has been to Paris there's an NYU campus there, by the way. Anyone who has been to Paris loves the intimate grandeur of the Place des Vosges that you see here in the Marais. But before this book came out, no one quite knew how it had come to be. To tell the tale, Hillary had to find the documents, of which there were none in the royal archives, as you might have expected. She intuited the pragmatic side of Henry IV and looked instead in the city archives, guessing correctly that the king would pass on construction costs to the merchants and noblemen. They've been doing so ever since. The story is fascinating in its own right, but what was most generative for architectural history as a discipline was her method, which shifted the lens away from the traditional wide-angle view of great buildings as monuments and pictures to a close-up look at the messy sausage-making that goes into the production of even a great urban fabric. I was stunned to read a scholar be so blunt about that. She wrote, the reader is asked to observe the buildings at an unglamorous proximity, but by witnessing them as they rise, as products of human aspirations and conflicts, and not as iconic images of urban splendor, we come closer to seeing how architectural forms, social forces, and political vision together produced the Paris of Henry IV. Much, of course, can be said about almost every great city on earth, and she was going to show that uh, repeatedly. I read those crisp words I just quoted when I was a graduate student and figured that a person of such mature erudition must have spent decades getting dusty in the French archives, hourly glasses pinched on her nose. And so, you can imagine my surprise when 10 years later, I actually met a woman of stately bearing, gorgeous elegance, and seemingly preternatural youth. 
Our lots were thrown together at that time when she was chair of the art history department at Columbia University and I directed NYU's Institute of Fine Arts. Our faculties, as faculty sometimes are, were fiercely competitive with each other because, because they both were supposed to be number one in the country. That competition, so soon after 9-11, made no sense to us, as we wanted the city to be a talent magnet for the arts and humanities, where our faculty and students could thrive and contribute to urban vibrancy. Does this sound familiar? It's what we're doing here, right? So we sought each other out to work on projects that transcended institutional interests for the sake of our discipline. Uh, we wrote this little thing together. I don't think we ever made too much money on it, but uh, Hillary did become an incomparable thought partner. So in 2007, she helped me decide to accept John's invitation to take on the startup process for MYU Abu Dhabi. And she did so by asking questions that came from her mind and from her heart, and then playing my answers back to me. It sounds so simple, but this was her key strength, I think, as a teacher and as a friend. Why does it excite you? Are you done with art history for now? How about Charlie and the kids? What do they think? She made me see new potentials in myself and encouraged me. So then, to test the reality of her enthusiasm for my sudden career turn, I implored her to join the enterprise as I knew that we would need a curriculum designer of her talents and also one who might have the sufficient urban vision to imagine and spatialize a university campus on a great big piece of empty sand on a virgin island in the Gulf. That was an unlikely thing to go do and it was a big ask of a friend who was on a leadership path at, an, at Columbia. Let me retrace that track at Columbia, which is little known in the MOU community, where we often prefer to forget that New York City has more than one great and spectacular private university. So this part comes with special thanks to Sarah McPhee, a professor at Emory University who was her first graduate student, and to Elizabeth Easton, the wife of Jimmy Traub, who is here, and one of Hillary's oldest friends. Once Hillary had completed her PhD at MIT, she applied for the Mellon Postdoctoral Fellowship at Columbia, one of these competitive positions. And at the interview with the faculty committee, one of the most formidable intellects and fearsome members was so impressed that he directed his colleagues not only to give her the fellowship, but forthwith to begin to bring her onto the tenure track faculty. And so Hillary began a very fruitful 22 year stint at Columbia. Her students there remember her as uncommonly well prepared, no surprise, focused and lucid. When lecturing, as I've already said, she did so usually without notes, working off beautifully sequenced slides of paintings, sculptures, buildings, or her favorite teaching tool, maps. In her scholarship, in her teaching, in, and in her, her architectural projects, private and institutional, she loved the capacity of maps to digest spatial ideas and communicate them to others. And she understood the way that maps also reveal the mental sets and the political realities of their time and place. She'd learned that in that work on Paris. She saw and taught that maps can be great tools for visioning new social landscapes and imagining better futures and even, as here, institutions. She commissioned the painting on which the Welcome Center uh, uh, work of art is based. A common theme in the students' memories of Pro Professor Ballon, there and at NYU, was her propensity to ask productive questions and stick with them, see them through, gently goading students on to answers they might not even have expected in the best Socratic tradition. Now, it's a, very, it's a great commonplace to say that the traditional model of the professor from being a sage on the stage has shifted to being a guide by the side. And that's true, we see a lot of that. The special thing about Hillary as a teacher, I would say, though, is that she could be both. Hillary won three distinguished teaching awards at Columbia, but also took on leadership roles across the institution. 
She directed Columbia's storied core curriculum, sound familiar? A great book's approach to undergraduate learning around big concepts, tough questions, and outstanding human achievements, written and otherwise. She served on the presidential search committee that brought John's friend Lee Bollinger, a national advocate for diversity and equity in higher education, that brought Lee Bollinger to Columbia from the University of Michigan. Despite her great Columbia prospects for further growth, I knew we had a shot at recruiting her. Hillary was never afraid of risk and always sought to deploy her talents in the best way that was available at any given moment. She'd done it before. After making her mark in French architectural history, oops, here, that's the shift she made before. <laughs> After making her mark in French architectural history, she had shifted her focus to her native New York. It was a pragmatic move, as she was recently married to Oren, and the kids were young, or perhaps even still on the way. But she made the shift seamlessly, taking on familiar topics and giving them new meaning, urgency, and a new sort of public appeal. Her ability to diagnose and imagine urban space became the basis of a stunning series of exhibitions, shows that made architectural history come alive because they identified the political and economic forces, the social dynamics, aesthetic options, and personal ambitions and, and proclivities that always do battle in the making of New York, just as she had done for early modern Paris. She addressed the great tragedy of the two successive Pennsylvania stations, left and right here, of the first from 1910, which was torn down in the 1960s, she wrote, Penn Station did not make you feel comfortable, it made you feel important. She understood that deeply about architecture, that elevating quality of space and its relation to mission. Her work on the stations was recently revisited by public officials as the city still needs to replace the miserable substitute you see on the right. She still has a voice in this. In 2007, she challenged the long accepted view of Robert Moses, the 20th century power broker of New York's redevelopment, as an irredeemable devil, a view that had been established by uh, Caro's book, The Power Broker. While not whitewashing Moses' crass bisections of historic neighborhoods with highways and his ruthless displacement of minority communities, she gave a context for his approach by diagnosing and describing analog processes that were at work all over the country in many cities. And she resuscitated his investment in public parks and beautification of public infrastructure that had been all but forgotten. Her exhibition, The Greatest Grid, of which you can see copies on display and for purchase outside. Her exhibition, The Greatest Grid, explored the history of Manhattan's master plan. That plan was created in 1811 by several visionary civic leaders to which she introduced us. She marveled that these guys had dreamed up a scheme that you see here who's for Manhattan, whose full benefits they would never reap themselves. She, she admired that they knew long before steel frame architecture and motorized transportation and reinforced concrete that this largely empty island of theirs needed to have an organizational scheme to accommodate future growth. Even 100 years later, much of it was still empty, as you can see in these photographs that she dug out. This is sort of the upper, the upper reaches of the island. And yet another century later, now, that same plan is accommodating millions of people in one of the densest, most creative, and most harmonious islands on Earth. It's Sadiat Island. Hillary, Island of Happiness. Hillary was surprised by the success of this particular show as she had not realized that she understood the Manhattan grid much better than the other four million of us who use it daily to navigate the city. She could help us understand this street plan afresh because it was hardwired into her body, I would say. Anyone who ever heard her redirect a New York City cab driver knows this. I mean, heck, she even argued with Uber, you know, if she do it the faster way. She had an antenna for the nearest parking garage, the best heel repair shop or cappuccino bar, especially those. And she seemed always 
sort of to be protected by a kind of grid karma when she plunged herself into the traffic in a shameless jaywalking move. She was a shameless jaywalker, even in Abu Dhabi. I think, though, that another reason Hillary understood that Manhattan grid so well and could make it sing for us is that her mind resembled it, its best qualities. Think about the qualities of the grid that she made us see. It's logical, but not rigid. Imaginative, but never fuzzy. It's rigorously intellectual, in fact, yet adaptively practical. Visually elegant, never grandiose. A flexible framework for future growth, and certainly something of lasting impact. As Hillary was completing the work on Moses, we were able to convince her that building a new university out of whole cloth in Abu Dhabi was just a new challenge she needed. I promised her she could surely be the Roberta Moses of Sariat. She rolled her eyes, but I think she liked it. We are forever indebted to Oren, to Sophie and Charles for their enthusiastic support and endorsement of her choice. And I am very grateful to you, John, for not declaring me crazy for bringing on yet another female art historian to go figure out how to do this thing here and plan it. You were extremely open to the thought. There is so much more to say about Hillary's role here, but as she embedded good writing across the curriculum, I will end on her ver verbal gifts. She often said that writing is thinking. I don't think that's true for everyone we know, but it certainly is true, was true for her. And it was just as true of her speech. Hearing her speak meant receiving a complete and well-formed thought. Shapely sentences flowed out of her mouth with that mellifluous resonance that her voice did not lose till the end. Her sentence structures were classical, but she delighted in new idioms, and she could be earthy when that was warranted. She had the most extraordinary gift for effective one-word assessments that I've ever heard. In many ways, she was a woman of few words. Extraordinary. Inchoate. Charmless. That was a real killer. Charmless just didn't go far with Hillary. But more often, it was positive. Fantastic. And my favorite, ungepatschket. Ungepatschket for anything that looked haphazard, thrown together, sloppily composed, or careless. Ungepatschket was aesthetic sin for this beautiful, highly organized woman. Hillary's linguistic efficiency also made her a fine analyst of the verbosity of others. Around 2004, she asked me how I like. <laughs> I didn't mean to look at you on purpose. I really didn't. You did. I just, I, yes, Let I did. the record show that you did. <laughs> but I'm going to hear, okay, and then the record will also go on about myself. <laughs> Around 2004, she asked me how I like my new Blackberry, that was still a relatively new thing for academics. Uh, my Blackberry, a tool that would become her outer brain eventually. I enthused on and on about its features and quirks and what it did well and not so well and so forth. After listening to me go on for a few minutes, she said, I get it. You like the functional integration. Ever since I've really liked functional integration, I hadn't <laughs> thought of it in quite that way. But Hillary, of course, as we know, was a model of functional integration in the best sense of those terms, and also of its counterpart, functional compartmentalization. Compartmentalization. Compartmentalization was her strategy for maintaining her dignity and humanity and her productivity at the most taxing moments of her illness. Throughout years of almost monthly chemotherapy, she rarely spoke of the toll it must have taken to maintain her commitments to work, to family, to family above all, to friends, to being a good person while facing her mortality. She preferred to focus on what she could do and help others achieve. With her fortitude, grace, and capacity for pleasure and love, she embodied her mother's favorite saying, which she liked to quote, and it's simple, life is for the living. 
Hillary's powerful presence and model for us is now retrospective, a beloved, beautiful gestalt we will never grasp in its precise and concrete form again. Hillary was unique. She thought that was a really lazy word, but she earned it. And there is a strange comfort in it. Because what she gave us is truly irreplaceable in the strong sense of that word, in that it cannot now be dislodged or dislocated, in that it has a place now in and among us. This consolation does not lessen our burden of mourning, of which Oren uh, and Sophie and Charles carry far and away the largest share. But this consoling thought nonetheless helps because it calls on us to continue to realize the aspirations she had for what we can be. That is John. So uh, I think I've been set up. I was told to come. There was no doubt about that. I was told it would be, uh, what was the phrase that uh, Marriott used? Free form in total. That Al would say a few words from the institutional aspect, that Marriott would talk about Hillary and her professional life and her contributions here at NYU Abu Dhabi and in the world. And then I should uh, provide some color and some anecdotes. I should tell some stories. I should, I should do the jazz thing and just kind of play off what they had done. Little did I know I would be described as a windbag. <laughs> and that such a title would be, would be given the moral authority of none other than Hillary Ballin. This was a cruel shot. But I'm delighted to play my, my part because I think like all of you in the room that knew her, I, I think about her often. To say every day would only be a slight overstatement. Uh, it's amazing the impact that she's had on the lives of those she touched. Oren and Sophie, our hearts go out to you and to your brother. I can only imagine, well, frankly, I, I have some sense of the void that's left by not having her present physically with you. But I believe and hope you can feel that her presence continues and her awareness of, of how well the three of you represent her in this physical world. I'm just gonna do some storytelling here. So I guess I'll start with this morning. Uh, you would think that if I arose at 6 on a morning when I was going to be teaching on this campus, that my thoughts about Hillary Ballin would be about NYU Abu Dhabi and of this campus. But they weren't, and it gives you some sense of her range. Uh, because uh, I was fully prepared for my two classes today. I had done that on the plane on the way over and last night before I, before I retired. Instead, I, I was working on the, the latest iteration of a chapter of a book that I'm happy to say is within a week or two of being finished which talks about the, the role of universities in the world 
and particularly in this world in which it is reasonable to fear that thought is dying and that the institutions of society are crumbling. So in that context, as I wrote the opening paragraph that had occurred to me about the importance of the date, October the 8th, 1958, I thought of Hillary Ballin. Now, October the 8th, 1958, was the beginning of the decline of contemporary American society. It was the day that the Daily News bore two headlines, the first of which, Sputnik is falling, the Russian satellite that had struck a blow to American self-confidence, thankfully was falling out of the air. We hadn't yet gotten to John Kennedy's speech and challenge that we would put the first on the moon. But the second and far more important headline was, the Dodgers are leaving Brooklyn. This was the day on which it happened. And of course, I, like, like many, and certainly as a person who wrote a book, Baseball as a Road to God, uh, knew the banality, the utter contemptuous eighth ring of hell banality of that moment. And I am one of those people who answers the famous question put at a bar one night in a conversation between Pete Hamill and Jimmy Breslin when Pete said to Jimmy, Jimmy, if you had Stalin, Hitler, and O'Malley, for those that don't know, O'Malley's the, the vile creature that moved the Dodgers out of Brooklyn to Los Angeles. If you had the three of them in a room and you had a gun with two bullets, who would you shoot? And any wise person would say, you shoot O'Malley twice. <laughs> And I had grown up with that belief. Now, during my time as president, I had an almost uniformly observed policy. 28 years as dean 20, uh, and president of the university. And over those entire 28 years, never once did I allow myself to be interviewed by the press, did I appear on television on anything that wasn't directly in my portfolio as dean of the law school or president of the university. I didn't want anybody to think I was using those positions to get myself on a platform. Even in areas of expertise, if I was called, I would say no, unless it was about something directly within my portfolio, such as funding for higher education. There were two exceptions, and they occurred in the last uh, few months of my wife's life. The first was I agreed at her insistence to appear on The Colbert Show, because she said it won't make a difference if you make a fool of yourself. The students will love it. And the second was I appeared and told a story about the Dodgers in a documentary, a great documentary, called The Brooklyn Dodgers, The Ghost of Flatbush. Now all of this comes back, as most of my stories do, to where I started, Hillary Ballin. Imagine my horror when I went to the showing at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, the first unveiling of this documentary, and I found out that it was a theme of this documentary based upon the work of Robert Caro in his homage to Moses, that it was not O'Malley that had forced the Dodgers from Brooklyn, but it was indeed Robert Moses. This, this deconstructed 50 years of deeply held belief. I, 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 I was bereft. I, I, one of the few people in the world I could actually say I hated 
was now taken from me as an object of hate. Thankfully, that afternoon, I had a meeting about NYU Abu Dhabi with Hillary. And when we finished the business, I said, listen, I've got to ask you a question. I saw this movie last night. And, and is it true that it was Moses and not O'Malley that moved the Dodgers from Brooklyn? And thankfully, Hillary said, yet another thing Caro got wrong. <laughs> and she explained to me the cleverness the absolute cleverness of O'Malley in demanding the one piece of property, a, a, a federal Section 8 housing piece of property, now occupied by the Barclays Center, yes, because the Section 8 expired, but there's one piece of property that Robert Moses couldn't demand, and he kept pounding the table demanding of Moses that Moses give him something he knew he could not. And that scholarship <laughs> saved my ability to castigate <laughs> O'Malley everywhere I go. And this is just one small <laughs> glimpse into the greatness of this woman. <laughs> you, you. So it's interesting upon reflection that the first crew that came to Abu Dhabi as part of the enterprise here consisted of five women. There was Mariette, of course, and Hillary, of course. It was Diane Yu and Linda Mills and Cheryl Mills. And those were the first face of NYU, other than this poor punim. Those were the first faces of NYU to the Emirates, to the Crown Palace, to the people with whom we worked, like Zaki. And there could not have been better faces. Now, what they've asked me to do is just g give you some sense of, of the context of all of this and, and, and tie it to the development of this place. So, so here I'll meander through a couple of relevant stories. Uh, it was Marriott and Hillary as a team, and it's hard to, to, to se separate them as a team. God bless the day that we decided that the, the, the first two in the enterprise would be these two magnificent art historians and friends. But it was they that, uh, that touched my kind of Brooklyn sense. We had, we, we had agreed to create some early, to use a, a Hillary word, incohate version. Some, I mean, part of the problem in the beginning was, was we had an intuition. We, we knew a direction. Uh, but, but, and and we, we had begun to, to vet it in, in expanding content-centric circles uh, at, at NYU, starting, of course, in our own group, but then out to expanding groups of faculty. Philip soon came on board, and David Chikatano soon came on board, and others. And we began to expand out. But, but the, 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 the jot and tittle, the details, we didn't, we didn't know. We knew they would come, but we didn't know. Uh, and we had agreed with uh, our partners here that uh, we would open in three years, September 2010. Now think back from that for a moment. Okay, that meant that sometime in the middle of August 2010, we had to have a full leadership team in place. In fact, that didn't make any sense, we said. We have to have the leadership in place at least a year before. And uh, that meant we had to have a campus with classrooms. Uh, and lo and behold, we had to have a faculty and students. Imagine that. We had to have students. So um, we began to think about how three years suddenly was beginning to look like a very short period of time. But it wasn't such a short period of time. It was three years. And what had just happened? We had just announced with great fanfare in the speeches to which uh, Marriott referred, and then in counterpart speeches here, 
We had just announced that, that we were going to open up this, this place of grand ambition. I mean, the idea initially, I, I don't know if you've seen the magnificent uh, uh, advertisement for the Emirates and for Abu Dhabi in particular featuring Fatma. If you haven't seen it, Google it or, or watch CNN uh, where it plays frequently. I didn't know we had made it. Okay, I saw it watching, but, but that notion that Abu Dhabi would become one of the world's idea capitals that's captured in, 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 in that uh, commercial for the Emirates itself, where they're using NYU Abu Dhabi to say this, this is what we are and hope to be. That was the original insight. That was the incohate insight of what we hope to build. And we knew we wanted to build as strong a place as possible, one that would be considered to be at the very, very top, and we had for years. So it was a grand ambition. It was a lot of work to be done. But, but what, what Hillary and Marriott brought to the table was they said, as, just as you've described her scholarship, look at it through the other person's eyes. We have partners in Abu Dhabi. They, they, they have just signed on for this enterprise. We have just had these fancy ceremonies. Are they going to experience silence for three years? Silence for three years? How can we expect in this post-O'Malley world where you can't even trust the Dodges to stay in Brooklyn? I don't think they said it exactly this way, but you get my meaning. How can we expect that, that trust will build between us, that the bond will build between us, that they will understand that we're real partners? We must start to have activities on the ground there now even though we're not opening the school. And when I raised that with Sheikh Mohammed, I was armed already with one idea, and he added another. The idea with which I was armed came from Hillary, which was the idea for the institutes. Think of how brilliant that was. In that intervening period, when nothing would have been happening, we would have been working hard, yes, but there would have been no visibility here of that work. In, 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 in that intervening period, we became, with good friends like Zaki and others, we became a real, a real presence here. And, and we were able to exhibit. You know, the lawyers will tell you, the most powerful evidence is an exhibit, not testimony. To say something is easy. To see it, to do it, that's important. And that's what Marriott thought about with the Institute. And that's when wonderful Philip came into, came into the scene uh, and, and, and began to build an intellectual life so that the people here could feel what it meant to be an idea capital at a world level. And importantly, people at NYU could begin to experience what this place, which after all wasn't, as some of them initially thought, called Abu Dubai, what this place was, and, and even on which continent it was, and other things they didn't know, and some still don't know. Okay, so this, this was a, a, an important insight. And then to that was added the Sheikh Mohammed scholars. Take our youth and expose them to what you're doing. And that, that began. Uh, again, a process of mutual understanding. These two contributions, which came from these two great women, these were brilliant for that intervening period. And they built trust. And, 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 and frankly, they, they allowed us to begin to, to, to bring a sense of what NYU was and what our values were to this place. My friend Tayeb Kamali, who at the time was the head of the Higher College of Technology, uh, one of the three male presidents at the time of the three national universities, insisted with the other two to Diane that uh, the class which the Sheikh Mohammed scholars would take uh, could not be co-ed. The parents wouldn't stand for it. And Diane explained, uh, I'm sorry, but John is going to be teaching the class I couldn't resist that. I couldn't resist that. John will be teaching the class, and he insists that it be co-ed. And Tayeb tells the story about how 
they were called to the palace to discuss this new idea of the Sheikh Mohammed scholars. And, 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 and when they arrived, there was a woman that they didn't recognize, dressed the way Marriott's dressed or Diane is dressed, uh, uh, but they didn't recognize her. They assumed, oh, John has now brought a sixth woman to the, to the Emirates. Uh, and they were startled when, when they sat down that this unknown woman sat at the head of the table. It was Sheikh Amariam. And as Tayeb tells the story, his heart began to pound because as a, a, a man who was not a member of the royal family, he had never seen a member of the royal family who was not covered. And when the topic of co-ed classes came up, Sheikh Amariam said, of course the class will be co-ed. And Tayeb said, that day things changed. These subtle changes that we understand here. But again, that, that flowed from this idea that had been created for the interim. So then there was another key moment. This perhaps the most important moment of all. I am not known uh, for timidity. Uh, if you reverse engineer from September 2010, and you want students, which we did, it seemed necessary. That meant that the students had to enter an application process in September 2009, which meant that they had to start thinking about entering the application process when they were sorting the schools, maybe schools they were going to visit or think about or write about or whatever. That had to happen somewhere uh, uh, around at the latest, January 2009. And if you wanted them to think about NYU Abu Dhabi as one of their schools, and you were looking for schools, the standard that we set, by the way, I don't know if you remember the norm. And when I say we here, the antecedent of we essentially is, is Marriott and Hillary, the two of them reporting a couple of times a week to me. So it's only with timidity that I include myself in the we for these purposes. But it was the two of them. Okay. Uh, and and uh, do you remember the standard that we set, the normative standard? It was clearly admissible to any school in the world. Those were the students we wanted. That, that if the Baydas or the Oxfords or the Harvards uh, could see and touch these students as they were, they would clearly want them. We wanted students the best would want. That was our standard. So we weren't just looking to fill a class. We were not look, looking, we, 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 in, in fact, in terms of, uh, of, of the students accepted, accepted, not applying to, but accepted into NYU New York, we wanted only the very top of that pool. Students that, candidly, we didn't typically get. That was our norm. They would end up going to the Baydas or the Oxfords or the, or, 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 the, or the Harvards or the Princetons or Yale, where Sophie and my daughter were friends. <laughs> so in any case, uh, we had to have those students thinking about us by January of 2009. This was only about 20 months away. And we began to work, because if they were going to think about us, we had to describe to them what the curriculum was. We had to describe to them who the faculty were. And you saw the papers. I mean, I'm trying to give you the context in which they were developed. And, and, and it was an extraordinary context. And, and, but who was it that became the linchpin for the development, both of that curriculum and of the faculty that, that wanted to be here. And by the way, here I got a key piece of advice. And it came from a person who, sh it should be noted, in the history of NYU, played this important role. His name is Jared Cohn. He was the president of Carnegie Mellon. They, they had a, quote, campus, close quote, in Education City in Qatar. And, and Jared was not only one of the presidents of a major research university that I admired most, but he was a good, good friend. And he encouraged us to go forward with this enterprise. 
And Jared said to me, please do not make the mistake that we made. Do not present this to your faculty as duty. Present it as privilege. Make the faculty understand how special this can be. Make them demonstrate the fact that they, they have earned a spot in this special place. Otherwise, it will not be special. And he told me horror stories about how the situation in Education City had devolved into being like the French Foreign Legion, where, where more and more and more was necessary because faculty saw it as a burden. It was like talking about what we do in the wonder of our teaching as teaching load as opposed to teaching privilege. And from the beginning, Marriott began to make that clear to faculty, and Hillary implemented it. And, and, and they worked together. And, and, and the faculty began to build the curriculum. Uh, it was interesting to observe, I'll come back to it in a minute, that each faculty member thought that his or her part of the curriculum was clearly the most important part of the curriculum. The most notorious, uh, uh, the most notorious of these faculty were, of course, the scientists with the legendary foundations of science. <laughs> we, but in any case, uh, Hillary managed to develop in, 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 in a short time with tremendous purchase by the faculty, the curriculum. And then we were able even to list. I remember we, 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 we put out a, a request to the faculty. Who would be interested in going to be part? Now, we only needed 12 people to teach. We were aiming for a class of 100. Al, in his wisdom, had said to us that the liberal arts college, which at the time was the best in the world, a small college in Pennsylvania, which with <laughs> got uh, what is called in the trade a 60% yield on its office of admission. So if we wanted a class of 100, we should admit 180. So we had to find 180 people to whom we could talk in a hotel room, because we didn't yet have a campus, and convinced that they should leave wherever they were in the four corners of the earth and come to a place called Abu Dubai, and that, and that they should be, they'd be taught by these names, uh, 12 of these names on a piece of paper that we could describe to them as among the best and most learned faculty in the world, and they'd be taught this curriculum. But it was, it was, all, uh, it was, it was, it was all just there. It, was all, it required an act of faith on their part. And at this point, the key moment came, the moment to which I referred before is perhaps one of the most important moments where Hillary's elegance and calm and my belief in her simple wisdom perhaps became existentially important for NYU Abu Dhabi. And I, I don't know that I've ever shared this moment publicly. It's a moment we lived. And I can visualize today the four of us, because Linda Mills was in this conversation because she was driving admissions. And it was Linda and Marriott and Hillary and me in the conference room in the president's office uh, sometime in March of 2009 when I said, we're not going to make it. We're just not going to make it. I, I, we cannot, we cannot fail. We cannot fail. We will only get one shot at succeeding. I have come to realize that as great as the and at this point we knew we had a great faculty, but, but that's not transparent outside of our walls. Right? We, we, we know the literature. We know the, who, who uh, merits this wonderful task, but it's not transparent. And awards and so forth don't make it transparent to the parents or of a high school senior, let alone to the high school senior, him or herself. It's not transparent. What do they know? They know who from their school went to that school last year. And did they respect that kid? Did they view that kid as the best of them? And it helps if they view that kid as kind of cool 
on whatever norm they use for cool. Right? And of course, we had none of those people. But the first class would define those people in the eyes of the world. The, the, the incoming class, all of a sudden, as I began to think about it, became much more important. It would define us. It would position us. And changing that position, once it was set, would be almost impossible. We had to come in with the very, very best. We had to be transparent that we, were, we had students that were clearly admissible to any school in the world. And I said, we're not going to be able to do it. There's not enough time. Okay, this process is only a few months away. And I'm happy to tell you that I have gotten the approval of our partners to postpone for one year and open in September 2011 and to use the campus that they will have ready in September 2010 as a study away site. And I don't want to compromise our standards. We will go through the admissions process, but if we only admit 20 students, we will admit 20 students if only 20 meet our standards. We will not lower the standards at all. And the other 80 can be study away students. And that's been okayed. And Hillary spoke first. And with those piercing eyes and tones, she said, you're wrong. We'll do it. We'll do it. I promise you we'll do it. And they did. And I can't resist adding a quick footnote to the story. Because as we rolled into the fall, meanwhile, Al had come on board, and Al and I and Marriott and Hillary were literally around the world uh, in hotel rooms, not talking to students and their parents, but talking to high school principals and guidance counselors and saying to the high school counselors and guidance counselors, we want you to understand what we're doing here. Look at the curriculum that Hillary has developed. Look at the faculty that Hillary has recruited. And this school is going to be something different. It's not going to be just another great university college. This school is going to combine the best of a liberal arts college, the tutorial system, and a research university. The faculty-student ratio will initially be one to three. The faculty will be chosen from the best in the world. A large class will be a class of 20. Some classes will be taught by the head of the Courant Institute and the chair of philosophy, team teaching a group of eight. This is the kind of enterprise that we envision. And we want only your best, but your best has to have two qualities. Your best has to be recognized as the best on the traditional norms so that we can't be dismissed as eccentric. Because if you're creating change, the first instinct is to dismiss you as eccentric. You've moved from the old norms. So they have to have all of the objective indicators that are necessary to the extent they can produce them. Although we'll look flexibly at students that can't produce them. Not that have done poorly in the traditional sense, but that can't for some reason produce them because they're coming out of a tribal village or off the streets of Russia or from a system where they can't get their records. So, okay, give us those, but they also have to have the cosmopolitan gene. They have to be willing to become not part of a school, but part of a mission. So we were going around the world, literally talking to guidance counselors. And, and, and as we moved into the fall, I was in a state of panic. Hillary was in a state of calm. And Hillary and Linda and Marriott came to me and they said, look, we have an idea. We're going to send out a letter to, at that point, we had seen maybe six or seven hundreds, guidance counselors and principals. We're going to send out a letter to them. Now, at this point, I began to fear a second problem. I'm not usually this timid. But my fear was that we would get 100 students or 40 students or whatever the number was, and at the end of the first year, they'd leave. That would really kill us. So I wanted to eyeball every one of those students. And I wanted them to see where they were coming. 
and I wanted them to hear us. And that's how Candidates Weekend was born, out of the fear that there'd be attrition at the end of the first year. We wanted people to understand the bargain, and we wanted to judge their souls, not just their, their resumes on a piece of paper. And therefore, Candidates Weekend was conceived. And we wrote to these uh, five or 600 guidance counselors and principals, and we said, we know nobody's applied yet. And we don't expect you to be able to tell us if a student's going to apply. But if you have a student that, based on the criteria we've given you, this is, this is all the way she did it, that based upon the criteria we, we've given you, if, if you have that student, we'll give them a trip to Abu Dhabi so they can touch and feel what we are. And we can eyeball them. They don't even have to apply. On your warrant, we'll fly them in. And therefore, the first Candidates Weekend occurred even before applications came in, in October of uh, 2009. And 49 students came in. And the minute they saw each other, they got it. The minute they saw each other, they got it. And in fairness, I think it was Carol who came up with the idea that uh, we put them in a circle and have them each in one minute introduce themselves. And the minute that circle was done, these kids understood what NYU Abu Dhabi was more profoundly than many of us did. And we went from there. And thankfully, and this is something I think about often, thankfully this occurred in 2009. And there was social media because the students from that weekend exploded onto social media about what this was. And we got thousands of applications the following weeks, thousands each week. And then the candidates' weekends became places where applicants came. 48 of those 49 students applied, 48 of the original 49. And I think we accepted maybe two thirds of them. They were so good. And of course, we accepted the 180 Al told us to, because that would yield 100, and 140 showed up. And one of the great statistics about NYU Abu Dhabi is not only its yield on admissions, which is the highest in the world, but is it's, it probably has the lowest attrition rate of any school in the world. Virtually every student who comes here stays here and graduates within four years. That's an amazing thing. I'm talking over 99%. So that gives you some sense from the battlefield of the context in which Hillary was working and the role she played. Uh, I will tell you that uh, as much as I admire the rest of the members of the team, uh, I don't think that anyone other than Hillary had the combination of skills and patience and intelligence and vision to see what this place could become and wisdom and sheer capacity to motivate and calm when calm was needed, all of us that were involved with this. It is not an exaggeration. It is not an exaggeration to say that not only would this campus not be were it not for Hillary Ballin, this place would not be were it not for Hillary Ballin. And that, Oren and Sophie, that is a major statement. That is a major legacy. Because this is not just a first class university that was created whole cloth in less than 10 years. That alone would be significant. But this is a first class university that has gathered people, faculty, students, and staff who are on a mission at a time when a broken world needs that mission more than ever. If there is any hope, if there's any reason for optimism that this world can knit together in a community of communities, it is this place. And I will tell you as I go around the world now, on behalf of the 600 million, 600 million primary and secondary uh, age kids who either are not in school or in schools that are no better than fourth grade schools, 
I say, you want a proof of proposition? Look at NYU Abu Dhabi. It has proven that there is talent in the world that if you don't go out and search for it, will be wasted to the world, and we cannot afford that now. This is not just a modest legacy. And this place and that mission would have died long ago if it had not been for her insight and persuasive skills. So she does live on, not only in your hearts and our hearts, but she'll live on through the spreading out of this work over generations to come in ways that we can't imagine right now because it's still all pretty incohate. Thank you very much. Speak up. <laughs> it's the thing is, well, you're being here. <laughs> Thank you, John. Those were your five minutes. Um, but <laughs> I mean, you look, look, look behind the chair at the finger I have raised in you. <laughs> no, but I didn't step on your lines, because I've seen what happens when someone does that. It was very moving. I, I think um, it would be very nice to finish uh, this, this um, period of mem memorializing Hillary, celebrating Hillary, I don't want to sound maudlin, by inviting a few memories or comments. Um, I, I could start myself, I haven't got a prepared speech, I have some notes. Of course, John mentioned her clear blue eyes, which I, are the first things that struck me. I remember the first time I met Hillary, and I, I remember the last time I saw her, and the first time what struck me is I was coming to your office to be interviewed. I think I wasn't told it was an interview, but I dressed no, up for it. You were my neighbor, but it was an interview. Mm. <laughs> and you met me at the door, but she was standing outside your office with a, a file watching me <laughs> approach. And it was like a kind of exercise in physiognomy of gait. You know, does this guy, <laughs> what's this guy going to need? Um, but it was just the uh, elegance and the, uh, the gesture of that, of that fact of her standing outside rather than just sitting down waiting inside. Of course, when I was inside, I was soon trapped. She had a clarity of vision as clear as her extraordinary blue eyes by which anyone who ever came into contact with her would have at one point or other have been captivated and entranced. One was locked into focused conversation from which there was no escape. So when she asked me to do something, there was no escape, and it felt that way. Uh, the last time I met her, she was sitting outside on, in C2, the third floor of outside the library on one of the canopies, sitting more or less in the center of that hall, and surveying her domain, it seemed like that, with this childlike smile. And she beckoned me over and said, hey, Philip, what do you think? Yeah. <laughs> It was such a loaded question because it took me back all those years from when I remember bumping into her at Washington Square Park and she looked at me and said, you know, we've got so much work to do. So at that moment when she said, Philip, what do you think? I felt like giving her a hug and saying you did it, but I was too timid to do that. So I said something pat, but it was a a lovely moment because I really did see her achievement in that question and her, her surveying her domain. Just on the subject of words, and that's my last memory, because we've talked about her qualities from from a, from you know from a, a high altitude, medium altitude. But you know, she the end, when I look back on my emails, and I was doing that in the, in the days coming up uh, into this this evening. I just found these very amusing exchanges we had. For example, when she was renewing my contract, <laughs> for the first, the first time she renewed my contract, I got given a strange title, and we joked about it sounding like a tongue twister, so I became Peter Piker Pet. Uh, Peter Piker Pet, Pe Peck of Pickle Pepper. Mm -hmm. I still can't say it, that is my title. Yeah. But it, it reminds me of another word that she invented for me. Um, because she was doing the accreditation and she was, and this was 
uh, just a show of how punctilious she was to, to detail. She uh, added some details to the syllabus that I had, had given her, and she said, please don't mind me. I'm, I've just become a, an accreditation zealot. Please do forgive my persnicketedness, uh, which either she invented or yeah. it was a... Uh, so there were these lovely moments that I remember, as well as the, the ones where I can just talk about those superb, sort of transcendent, sublime qualities she had. Uh, at, at that, I'll open up the floor for others to perhaps share their memories or make comments on their experience with Hillary through the years. Peter. To Peter, my, a microphone. Oh, you have to wait for the mic, yeah. So Dean and I started with Hillary um, way back in 08 in those offices on the 12th floor of Bobst. And so first of all, thanks, Marriott, for reminding us about her extraordinary exhibits. And uh, there's, I think, one still going on. Is that right? Uh, at the, Fu the Futures Lab at the City of New York Museum, yeah. So, but one of the thing that, you're right, that she was, um, wouldn't hold back on her critique of things and of ideas, but, but she was also very generous in her time and a, a tremendous thought partner. And this adventure of ours uh, has been very challenging to figure out all the pieces. And what, what Hillary would always lend to me was time to sit down and help me think through things, which oftentimes at the beginning of our meeting seemed impossible. And by the time we had completed the conversation, it seemed organized and achievable, and she was such a blessing to work for. Um, we will miss her terribly. Thank you, Peter. Is anybody? Oh, Diane? I'm Diane Yu. One of the things that hasn't been mentioned was how Hillary's exquisite taste and a beauty and appreciation of beauty has been manifest in millions of ways here in, in building and shaping this campus. Um, I worked with, with Mariette and Her Highness Sheikh Amadiyam in creating the Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Scholars Program, but when we had the program ready to go, I needed materials. I needed ways to publicize it. I needed all sorts of things that would help get the word out to a country that had never had a program like this. <coughs> and when I sat down with Hillary, she had so many ideas on the look of our materials. The, and she said it's important to have a coherent vision that shapes the way people are gonna think about this program in years to come. You know, I just thought, well, applications, you know, put a little letterhead on. And she said, no, it needs to be beautiful. <laughs> It needs to be attractive. It needs to show the dignity and the class of this thing. And regardless of how the curriculum may change over time and regardless of how these buildings may be used different ways, we will never, I think, forget how she brought this physical and attractive beauty to everything she touched. And it really has made such a difference in how people react to and respond to what we're trying to accomplish here. Thank you, Dan. Oh, Jim. Hi, my name is Jim Traub. Um, I think I've known Hillary longer than anybody else here, since I knew Hillary when she was 16. Uh, and I was older, I was, I was 17. <laughs> and even then, I think you would have used the word about Hillary that, that people tend to use, which is she was a formidable person. Because even then she was tall and she was beautiful. And when everybody dressed like a slob, she dressed beautifully. She had this great elegance of person. And it was only, I think, a small number of people who knew Hillary well, who saw that in her own mind, she didn't think about herself as an impressive person at all. In fact, I don't think Hillary thought about herself a lot. She thought about other people. So there was a small number of people, I think, the people who were close to her, who knew that she was 
who knew how, in her own mind, she was really a modest person and a generous person and a warm person. The older she got, we all want to think that as we get older, we have a, a deeper self-understanding. The older she got, the wider the circle of people, I think, whom Hillary showed the deep Hillary to. And I, I would see this all the time. I would see that kind of, that warmth, that generosity, <coughs> that love, that real profound uh, modesty, that interest in others, not herself, that shone through more and more and more. And I think towards the end of her life, when, um, I mean, I've known a lot of people who have, who have uh, died slowly, as the last Hillary did, and it brings out uh, someone's character. Hillary was completely about others, about, she never talked about being sick, she never talked about herself, ever. Even with me, who had known her so long, I would say, Hillary, how are you? She'd say, fine, how are you? Tell me how your trip over here was. You know, That's all she wanted to know about. And that became all of her by the end. And I, I found it such a, a beautiful and touching revelation of her inner character. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jim. If there's no one else, I th well, Cyrus. Hi, my name is Cyrus Patel. I teach literature here, and I joined NYU in 1993. Um, I started working on the NYU Abu Dhabi project in the fall of 2008 as a member of the Humanities Coordinating Group, and I became very interested in the project of bringing together a research institution and a great liberal arts college here in this kind of global crossroads. That seemed to me an opportunity to do something really remarkable. And at a certain moment, my wife and I were thinking that maybe we were needing a new challenge, and we thought about moving to the Midwest, and Hillary and John and uh, Reinhard Falkenberg, the first Dean of Arts and Humanities, convinced us to double down on the NYU Abu Dhabi project and uh, to spend time here in NYU Abu Dhabi. And the thing that you've heard tonight is that Hillary was a great scholar. But to me, the most important contribution that she made was, as a great scholar, to be absolutely, absolutely committed to the project of the liberal arts education. And I've been thinking a lot lately, in fact, I was, I was having a flashback moment yesterday because I took a group of students to see some Shakespeare in Dubai, and it was on one of those same buses that we used to ride in the first set of candidate weekends in 2008 and 9 when we were staying at the Sheraton Corniche. And I had this flashback to, to thinking about what I learned about the project was that it was these students that made all of this special. We can do really, really great research here. We can produce groundbreaking things. We can come up with new things. And you know, there's a lot of people that do great research. What really fundamentally, I think, ennobles us as a research institution is the fact that we also teach these fabulous undergraduates. We share the research with them. We involve them in the research. So I think, I hope that, that, that for me, that's the lesson that Hillary gave, that these two things absolutely can go together. Great research, great scholarship, and great teaching. And I, I take that with me, I hope, every day when I walk into the classroom. Thanks, Cyrus. There's no more. Um, I do know that Mariette would like to say something else, some, some other thing. What occurred to me as I listened to these fantastic testimonies from everybody, and thank you, uh, is that if Hillary were hearing all this, she would, she would certainly be very pleased. You know, I, there's no question about that, and find a lot of it true, but she would certainly agree with Jimmy, who's spoken so powerfully about her modesty in seeing all this as, seeing her role really as a facilitator rather than somebody doing it all alone. And her, we haven't probably talked quite enough about collaboration. John, you did cite, of course, the, the kind of the back and forth that we all had. And I think one of the qualities that, especially the many faculty involved in the generation of the curriculum, that really was an effort where we had to draw on the entire plenitude of NYU's professional and uh, arts and sciences schools. Uh, Philip was involved, Dave was involved, so many people got involved. And within a year, Hillary knew more people uh, at NYU from the faculty than I had met in my entire time at the Institute of Fine Arts. So that, that was already very striking. So she would certainly stress that collaborative uh, quality. 
And along with that, I think she would, um, it, 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 what she did, I think, for many of us. In, in, I had anxiety too, John, and we were on the line. We had to go do this. And so the first question was sort of, well, even before we hire the faculty and go find the students, what is that curriculum going to be? When you don't have anyone to teach it yet, and you don't know who you're going to teach. That was that orchestra we had to, had to kind of make up. And so I had considerably cons considerable concerns about that. And so in the, the fall of 2007, I think I remember saying to her, gee, you know, I had a bad dream. I just don't know how we're going to do this and how we're going to wrestle this to the ground. And she said, Mariette, we will create incentives that will unleash the creativity of the faculty of NYU. Just like that. And she believed it and she did it. And so although I think she would say it's a collaborative effort, I think it is that sort of the modesty was joined with an incredible confidence that came out of sort of purposefulness and the kind of commitment that Cyrus just cited. It's a gift that we carry. So can I just say two things? Um, because I want to pick up on something very quickly that John said, which was the genius of the Institute. Her idea to create the Institute ahead of, ahead of the three years that it would take for the campus to be here properly speaking. And, um, because there had to be no silence here, there had to be an NYU here. When I was asked by Hillary, trapped in, in that glare, <laughs> to come to the Institute, which didn't exist, I thought, what, what on earth is she asking me? This <laughs> doesn't exist yet. We've got to build a university. It we got that question a lot. Yeah, I know, but I was the <laughs> one who was asked to go out and do it. So, but I realized as soon as it started to work that it was a, a decision of genius. I'm just struck also by, if I could just end with a metaphor. Because I think I, I see the, the, her interest and knowledge of writing about the greatest grid as a kind of metaphor for mm -hmm. what she brought into NYU Abu Dhabi. Because in, in 1811, we had this priming of two centuries of time that would develop out from an initial idea, and it was, if anyone primed two centuries of time, or however much time, into this place for it to develop, it was Hillary. But she also, I was watching the YouTube video of her talking about the greatest grid, and she mentions, interestingly, the fact that Olmsted, who designed the park, was dead against the grid, because he thought it spoiled the natural growth of, the, of, the, of Manhattan. But, but this was a, such a great example of just listening to Hillary and being convinced. So by the end of the, her speech, you realize that Olmsted was wrong. <laughs> so she could recognize things that she had to argue against or opposition. Or, um, so without further ado, I think we take all our thoughts and our memories um, and adjourn. And, but first, thank John and Maria for, and of course, Al for the welcome remarks um, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us and I'd like to also reiterate our thanks to Oren Kramer and Sophie Kramer for, um, for being here with us today it makes all the difference thank and you. for lending so much of her to us mm -hmm. because you folks bore the brunt of it thank you thank you